So um, thank you. It's an honor to be invited to give this presentation and um, uh, tell you what we don't know and a little bit about what we know about the great oxidation event, one of the great transformations, maybe after the origin of life, the greatest transformation in the history of life on Earth. Um, just to orient you a little bit to what, the, what it is we're trying to understand, this is a, a quick cartoon showing you the relative abundances of the gases in the atmosphere. Most of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen, but the next most abundant gas is oxygen at about 21% today. So the question is, how did it get to be that way? It wasn't always 21%. And it's rather important that it's 21% because we wouldn't be here otherwise um, to enjoy this, enjoy this conference and enjoy everything. Um, so um, this, is, this is a first order challenge in Earth history, trying to understand how the atmosphere got to be the way it is. The answer to that, um, we don't fully understand, but we know that the way we get to it is through the rocks. Um, I think it was Carlo yesterday showed a picture of a banded iron formation. So this is a, a, a spectacular setting in Western Australia where you can see these banded iron formations. Um, these are rocks that appear um, uniquely towards the middle part of Earth history, then they go away. And we essentially never see rocks like this in the geologic record afterwards. And we think this has to do with the rise of oxygen. Um, I show you this particular um, uh, as a website, this particular picture as a website, because this is a teaching resource here that I think might be useful to some of you, that uh, a group that I lead at Arizona State University, the Center for Education Through Exploration, produces. We produce virtual field trips among other things, we produce immersive, interactive, virtual field trips that take you to places where your students, unfortunately, will, and most of us will never get to go, but we've gotten to go to some of these places and capture uh, some pretty exciting um, renderings and imagery and, and data from these places and, and have these as resources that you and your students can go visit. Um, and in some cases, we've built interactive and adaptive lessons that take students through these locations and teach particular scientific concepts. Um, so that's the, there's a link to this in the brochure, in the, in, the pack, in the packet. If you go to my page there, there's some links, and one of them is to vft.asu.edu, which is a website that has dozens of these virtual field trips and growing a little bit every year. Um, so um, what we want to understand in this particular case is the origin, the cause of the great oxidation events. This is a plot showing you oxygen through time. So here's four and a half billion years ago, here's today. And this is a summary from a few years ago of oxygen in the atmosphere over time. So here we are today at around 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. Here's the first half of Earth history with very little or no oxygen. And then there's this sharp change that happens around 2.3 billion years ago. We argue about the exact date. Roughly halfway through Earth history, we have this sharp increase that we refer to as the great oxidation event. So this is what we want to, we'd like to understand why this happened big transition in the history of the planet. Not the only transition involving oxygen. And worth noting that this is, if you're teaching a math class, this is worth pointing out. This is a log plot here. The axis here is log, logarithmic. And on a log plot, this looks like the big increase. But if you were to plot this as a linear plot, this would be the big increase. Right? So sometimes, you know, when you switch from linear to log, things can look quite different. So, um, so there's a second big increase here in the Neoproterozoic, the Neoproterozoic oxygen, oxidation event. And this um, really made the rise of animals possible. But this rise wouldn't have happened if this rise hadn't happened first. So we refer to this one as the, the great oxidation event, even though in actual amount of oxygen it's smaller. Because here we went from almost nothing to something that we argue about how much, but something appreciable. So before we launch into what happened um, it's, and why, maybe we should talk a little bit about why we care. Um, certainly in education, that's something your students will ask you about. I get asked all the time, not just by students, but why, why do we care about this? And I'm going to give you two reasons that both um, come from this orientation about thinking about the Earth as a planet. This is a, this is a pale blue dot. This is Earth. You're all in this picture. All of us were in this picture a few years ago when it was taken. This is from the Cassini orbiter when it was orbiting Saturn, and they pointed it back to Earth to take a family portrait of all of us. So here's Earth as a planet. And when you think about Earth as a planet, there are two big areas that uh, pop into our minds, many of us who are geoscientists, one is to think about life on other planets and how we would look for it. How would we look for life on this planet from a distance like this? So the, the, the astrobiology questions that motivate many people. And the other question that motivate many people when you're a geoscientist or just a citizen of the planet, an occupant of the planet thinking about the future, are Anthropocene questions about the future of this world. And in both cases, the oxygen question has some, some very big picture relevance. 
So from the astrobiology standpoint, as most of you probably are aware, we're discovering planets outside our solar system at a crazy, crazy pace. There are now over 3,000, over 3,500 confirmed planets orbiting other stars. So 25, 30 years ago when I was a graduate student, it was science fiction. So even you would consider it kind of crazy to try to go into that field of science. And now it's almost boring. It's like easy to find planets. That's kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, Almost a thousand of the planets that have been found are terrestrial planets, meaning they're rocky planets. They aren't quite necessarily Earth-sized, most of them are super-Earths, but these are planets where we can start thinking about life like ours on, and, and, and this is growing all the time. Every time I give a version of this talk, I go to the JPL website and update these numbers because they change weekly. So um, we're finding exoplanets all over the place. Uh, this is the Kepler Space Telescope, which is one of the main ways we found a lot of these planets. And it, it finds planets by looking at dips in the brightness of light from the star as a planet passes in front of the star. And that sets up the ability to do, once we get better telescopes, spectroscopy. You can imagine if you have a planet passing between us and a star that the light that's going through the atmosphere of that planet will be dimmed differently, will absorb certain wavelengths of light due to the gases in the atmosphere, and you can do spectroscopy and tell what the atmosphere is made of. We can't really do that now for terrestrial planets orbiting other stars, but we will be able to. It's a big goal that NASA and, and ESA have, um, the so-called spectroscopic search for biosignatures. And um, oxygen looms very large among this, the, the ways we might do this. Um, so here, looking at our solar system as an example, here's Venus, Earth, and Mars. And if we look at in the infrared wavelengths, we see that the atmosphere of Venus has this big feature due to the absorption of carbon dioxide. So there's a, the Venus atmosphere is about 90 times Earth's atmosphere and pressure, and it's almost all carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is a very strong infrared absorber. So it's a very strong infrared feature and not much else. Mars, Mars has almost no atmosphere. It's an atmosphere of six millibars of pressure. It's, it's, it's six thousandths of the Earth's atmosphere, but it's also almost entirely CO2. So there's this big absorption feature due to CO2, and there's really nothing else. If you make the same kind of observation of Earth in the infrared, you again see a CO2 feature. The Earth has 400 ppm CO2 and rising. Um, but you also see this interesting feature here from ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. You don't see this in the Venus or, the Venus or Mars atmospheres. And ozone is a byproduct of having a large amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And so this is arguably diagnostic of life. The spectroscopy of Earth's atmosphere looks different than the spectroscopy of the atmospheres of Venus and Mars because Earth has life which pumps out oxygen through photosynthesis and, and gives us this, this feature. So this is one of the sorts of data that astronomers want to obtain from planets orbiting other stars or to look for. Right? And if we found something like this, we'd get very excited. And then we'd argue about whether or not there are non-biological ways to make that and we'd have you know, 20 more years of controversy, but at least we'd have, we'd have moved the ball down the court in terms of what we're arguing about. So, so oxygen looms large in this astrobiology field. Um, and so wanting to understand, it's kind of important to understand what controls oxygen in the, in the atmosphere. From the Anthropocene perspective, um, you know, we're entering this epoch of Earth history where the future of the planet is very much in the hands of us, of beings walking around with big brains and hands who are a big evolutionary innovation on this world, perhaps as big an evolutionary innovation as the, as the photosynthesizers that evolved We'll talk about when they evolved um, and changed the surface of the planet. Um, so the Earth is very much in our hands, and that's leading to all sorts of amazing and scary ideas like deliberate intervention in the Earth's climate system as a way of coping with what we've been doing accidentally to the Earth's climate system. So ideas of deliberately removing CO2 from the atmosphere, sort of cleaning up our waste, or deliberately modifying the Earth's atmosphere to reflect sunlight. These are ideas that are being taken very, very seriously in the most, by the most august scientific bodies. The Natural, National Research Council of the US issued a report on this a few years ago, working on another one now. Um, so there are ideas like this that are out there as we enter this sort of, hopefully adulthood, at least teenagerhood of humanity on the planet. Um, and there are ideas like this that are floating around. Elon Musk wants to terraform Mars. Now we're a long way from doing this, but this, is the kind, this kind of talk is out there and it's, it's going beyond science fiction into people who actually have industrial capacity to try to do things. This is where Elon Musk is aiming. He wants to make Mars green. Okay, if we're going to start modifying the Earth, let alone modifying other planets, if this is something we're really going to think about, we, we kind of need to understand the system that we're modifying. And if we don't understand why the Earth has 20% oxygen in the atmosphere and how it got to be that way, which is one of the first order things you could ask about in our atmosphere, then I think you could rightly say that our knowledge is pretty primitive compared to our ambitions and our abilities. And this is something we might want to try to understand. If you want to understand the Earth system, 
one of the first order things you might want to be able, be able to explain is, when did the Earth's atmosphere become 20% and why did that happen in oxygen? It's like a first order feature of the atmosphere. If you can't explain that one, you know, we're in bad shape trying to do anything deliberate to Earth, let alone try to replicate Earth somewhere else. So, so for both these reasons, both the astrobiological and the anthropocentric reasons, uh, this oxygen pursuit is a very big picture, important thing to try to figure out. So, so what caused the great oxidation event? And I'm just noticing that the timer didn't start, so I have no idea if I'm on pace or not. Just, so Carlo, please, uh, or Mac, Maco. Yeah, I, I know I'm okay right now, but later on, let me know. So what caused the great oxidation event? How do we get oxygen in the, in the atmosphere? So there's one process that nobody talks about very much, but is worth, um, worth noting so that you're aware of. There is a continual source of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere from the loss of hydrogen out the top of the atmosphere. This is a process that happens all the time. It's happened throughout Earth history. It's happening right now. We can actually see um, emission of photons from this process. Hydrogen is being lost at the top of the atmosphere. We heard a little bit about it yesterday from John Tarduno in the context of the Martian atmosphere, the idea of atmospheric loss. It happens on Earth, too, for hydrogen. And if you lose hydrogen, you leave behind oxygen. Most of that hydrogen is coming one way or another. It was, it was kind of paired with, with oxygen and water at one point. And as you lose hydrogen, you gradually oxidize the planet. So there's a continual sort of geophysical source of oxygen over time, and people argue about its magnitude. Um, and it certainly plays a role. But there's no reason to think there was some big inflection or anything like that, or some big change halfway through Earth history in the rate of hydrogen loss. So we don't think this is the story about the, the great oxidation event. We don't think this is, this is it. But it's a factor that needs to be thought about and considered. The textbooks will say something like this, especially the biology textbooks will say something like this. The rise of oxygen is due to the evolution of photosynthesis. Life figured out how to take CO2 and water and react them to make oxygen and organic carbon. This is the geochemist's way of writing organic carbon. We don't actually mean the molecule CH2O, we mean the stoichiometry, one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen in a whole array of different molecules. Um, my chemistry friends, especially my biochemistry friends, are horrified whenever I write this equation down, but stoichiometrically it makes sense. One CO2 to one water to makes one oxygen and an organic carbon molecule. Um, so the, the biology textbooks will tell you, well, this evolved and oxygen rose. End of story. We can drop the mic. We can drop the mic and go out, right? That's the end of the, end of the game. Um, but the geologists, if you look at the geology, it's more complicated than that. And since we're here at a gift workshop, not a biffed workshop, um, since it's a gift workshop, we're going to delve a little into the geology. So this is a virtual field trip to Shark Bay in Western Australia. Um, to Karbala Beach specifically. Um, and this looks kind of nice and pretty, but kind of nondescript. Until you go under the water, when you see these mound-like things all around you, and if you, and these are really interesting to swim around with. It's kind of cold also too, but once you get over the shock of how cold it is, they're really interesting to swim around. Um, and if you look at these things very closely, what you find is that while they look like rocks, they're really not, or they're not purely rocks, they're layers of microbi microbes and, and sediment interbedded. And the microbes that are living here are dominantly cyanobacteria, and they're cyanobacteria that are making oxygen. And we call these things, um, when they're fossilized, we call them stromatolites. These are modern versions of what we find in the ancient fossil record that are called stromatolites. And they are these very complex microbial communities that leave behind a very distinct geological marker in the form of these things, which when they get buried and lithified, they're, they're pretty distinctive in, in ancient rocks. So and when we go back in the geologic record, what we find is that before the rise of animals, you go back before a half a billion years ago or so, you find the fossil remains of stromatolites are quite common. You find them even if you go back before the Great Oxidation event, 2.7 billion years ago. This is in Western Australia. Go up this ridge here. I don't know if the lighting works well, if you can see this all that well, but, but um, we'll zoom in to this cross section. And you can find these fossilized stromatolites that are, here we're gonna zoom in over here, that are absolutely spectacular and you can Again, if the lighting were a little better, you could see all the glorious detail in here. I'm not a paleontologist, 
um, let alone a geomicrobiologist, but those who are look at these and say, oh yeah, we can, we can pretty convincingly argue that these are fossilized forms of those stromatolites that we were swimming amongst in Shark Bay uh, that you can find living today. And when you go back um, into the, the Precambrian before the, the rise of animals, this is the dominant form of life that you see in terms of anything macroscopic that you can see that's biological. Today, these stromatolites that we see today make oxygen. And so it's quite conceivable that these are making oxygen as well. And notice the date here. This is 2.7 billion years ago. The Great Oxidation Event is 2.3 billion years ago. So we're already quite a bit of time before the Great Oxidation Event here, and we see these stromatolites. We can go to some of the oldest sediments that we, that we know of, oldest nicely preserved sedimentary rocks. These are the um, these are rocks in the Dresser Formation, 3.5 billion years ago in Western Australia. And they aren't nearly as well preserved, um, but they are not terrible. And you can make an argument that in some of these rocks we see structures, features, that, are, um, that have been interpreted again as being stromatolites at 3.5 billion years ago. And if you look at the detailed morphology of these, of these stromatolites, the argument has been made that, that indeed they were oxygen producing stromatolites. Now that's not a slam dunk, that's very contentious, but you can at least make the case, and it's not a weak case, that there could have been oxygen production as early as 3.5 billion years ago, just based on the fossil record. So the Great Oxidation Event happens at about 2.3 billion years ago, but well before that, there's, there was certainly biology, there was certainly phototactic biology that was making use of sunlight, and there's a good case to make anyway that that biology was making oxygen. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, photosynthesis turns on and oxygen takes over the world. Now, we being geochemists, we don't believe all that morphological fossil stuff, some of us. Well, it's not that we don't believe it, it's that we, we, we trust magical things that emerge from our mass spectrometers more. So, um, so we work with our paleontological partners to do things um, that are geochemical to try to confirm, verify, and extend what, what the paleontologists find, the paleobiologists find. So what I'm going to walk you through here now is a little bit of stuff that my group and collaborators have done looking at, of all things, um, the element molybdenum. Why molybdenum? Have any of you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy in this room? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, ever read that? Yeah? What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42, it's element 42, so of course you'd use molybdenum. What else would you do? Um, but that's not the real reason we use molybdenum. The reason we look at molybdenum in, the, in ancient rocks is because it turns out the geochemistry of molybdenum in the environment is very sensitive to the amount of oxygen that's around. It's a proxy for oxygen. The amount of molybdenum in certain kinds of sediments is a proxy for the amount of oxygen in the environment. We can't record ancient oxygen directly in rocks billions of years ago, but we can reconstruct the amount of molybdenum that was in rocks laid down billions of years ago, and from that infer what the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans was, or draw some inferences. And molybdenum is not the only element, but it's probably the one that's been looked at the most carefully in this regard. So there's a number of, of molybdenum-related arguments that I could make to you, um, uh, but this is probably the simplest one to, to get across in a short talk. Um, so molybdenum, in, in, uh, in crustal rocks, especially in igneous rocks, which are the primary rocks of the, that make up the crust, molybdenum is found inside sulfide minerals, dominantly. Sometimes it's an impurity in pyrite, and sometimes it's molybdenum sulfide, molybdenite is a sulfide mineral that is a molybdenum-bearing mineral. But either way, those sulfide minerals are major reservoirs of molybdenum in the crust, and they react quite vigorously with O2. Right? Sulfide minerals oxidize quite readily if you expose them to oxygen. They don't necessarily fall apart right away sitting on your desk, but give it geological time and you know, your fool's gold, your iron pyrite sitting on your desk is not going to last all that long because it's reacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So the logic of using molybdenum as a paleoredox proxy goes something like this. Imagine I've got a continental crust that has molybdenum in sulfide minerals in it. If there's no oxygen in the environment, if oxygen is absent, then that molybdenum basically stays locked in the sulfides. And if it stays locked in the sulfides, there's really not much opportunity for molybdenum to get into the oceans. And so the molybdenum concentration of the oceans is low. And if you go to ocean sediments that could scavenge molybdenum, if it was there, you'll find that there isn't much molybdenum there. But if I turn oxygen on, if there's oxygen around in the environment, then these sulfides oxidize, they fall apart, they deliver their sulfur and their molybdenum into the oceans, and the molybdenum content of the oceans rises, and I can find evidence of that in the geologic record. That's, the, that's the, the, the simple logic. And we can make it more complicated with equations and math and talk about solubilities and stuff like that, but the logic is basically this. 
right? So no oxygen, molybdenum stays locked up in the crust. Oxygen around, molybdenum can accumulate in seawater. And all the rest is important commentary. So we can go into ocean sediments that are ancient. Uh, we, we look at the kind of sediments in which molybdenum um, can accumulate if it's in the water in the first place. Not all sediments will scavenge molybdenum. For example, uh, calcium carbonate rocks are very molybdenum poor. Molybdenum doesn't really go into calcium carbonate very well. But molybdenum goes very nicely into black shales, into carbon-rich, organic carbon-rich rocks that make that uh, sediments that ev eventually make up these kind of sedimentary rocks called black shales. And so there's a small cottage industry of us going around drilling ancient sedimentary sequences to get these nice black shales out that are well-preserved um, and then measure the heck out of them for molybdenum and other trace elements and isotopes to try to reconstruct what the chemistry of the waters was, waters were where these sediments were accumulating billions of years ago. And when we've done that, we've been able to do things like this. So here we're looking through time. Here's today. Here's three billion years ago. So we're not going all the way back here yet. So zero to three billion years. Here's molybdenum concentration in black shales. So what's been done here is to get black shales through time, measure the molybdenum contents, um, and then plot them up. And what you can see is, in the last half billion years or so, the molybdenum contents are quite high, which makes sense, because in the last half billion years or so, there's been a lot of oxygen in the environment, 10, 20% oxygen. Molybdenum should be a very mobile element in that world. It should be abundant in seawater, like it is today. Today, molybdenum is the most abundant transition metal in seawater. Still very scarce. But, it's, but, it's, but compared to other metals, it's quite abundant in seawater. And that was probably true for most of uh, the last half billion years or so. And that's why you see enrichments all the way up here. Then you go earlier, remember I mentioned that, that neoproterozoic oxidation event. So we go before that time and molybdenum concentrations are lower. And then we go further back and there's not a lot of data and the concentrations are lower still. So you have this sort of first order confirmation of this kind of threefold or two-step change, low, something goes up, and then it goes up again, kind of like what I showed you before for oxygen. And this is, this is, this is one line of evidence that's taken, to say, to taken as support for the hypothesis I gave you that we can use molybdenum as a way of tracing oxygen through time. But let's dig into this a little bit more. So that great oxidation event happens at about 2.3 billion years ago. That's right around here. Here's 2.5 billion years ago, and you can see that molybdenum is actually somewhat it's actually not, there's not a big difference here. There's not a big step here. Hmm, what's going on here? So let's look at this more closely. So this is a, this is a data that, that my group and collaborators generated about 10 years ago at this point. Um, we, we, we wanted to look at, sorry, at, whoops. Back at that point of time, we didn't have these data that was just very low. We said, well, let's start looking before the great oxidation event and see, is there molybdenum around in the environment? And what we found is in these rocks from about 2.5 billion years ago, where there's these beautifully preserved black shales, when we looked with depth in these rocks, we found this enrichment of molybdenum. It's kind of transient, but there's an enrichment of molybdenum that goes up to around 40 parts per million at around 2.5 billion years ago. This is a healthy amount of molybdenum. And you can look at other tracers. We won't go into all this because it gets into all sorts of geochemical nerd nerdiness that we don't need to go into and don't have time for. But all sorts of things kick here at the same time. And you can argue about alteration and stuff like that, but, but we and most people are pretty convinced at this point this is all primary. It's all telling you something about the original seawater. And what we think we see here is a transient uh, pulse of molybdenum into the environment. And we've argued that that actually reflects a transient whiff of oxygen, small amounts of oxygen wafting into the environment in sort of variable ways. A bit like today, right? Today, methane is a rare gas in the atmosphere, but, but it's around and it varies in concentration. Certainly over, over tens and hundreds and thousands of years, it can vary up and down. And so we would argue that in this pre-great oxidation event environment, we had oxygen as a minor gas, but one that varied around. And sometimes you might get a, a pulse of it for a few million years, depending on vagaries of biological production and other things that are going on. So we call this the whiff of oxygen. And the picture that emerges from this and other studies is that during that first half of its history, Whereas today, the, it's quite simple, more or less. Oxygen penetrates through the water column in most places, most parts of the world, the, the environment, is, the oceans are thoroughly oxygenated. We think that before the Great Oxidation event, it was a more complicated picture. We had large volumes of ocean water that are, were so-called ferruginous. They had very little oxygen, but lots of iron. That's why you could get those banded iron formations. 
And then as you went to the nearshore environment, you had, we argued, and this is not just us, this is a classic argument actually, you had cyanobacteria living close to the seashore, producing oxygen, creating an oxidized um, near surface region in sort of oxygen oases. So, so regions, lar large but contained regions that were oxygenated in the shallow waters. Um, overlying, and for paradoxical reasons we could talk about later on, you get these very reducing sulfide-rich regions below that. But the, the basic story here is a kind of heterogeneous story with some oxygen around in these nearshore environments probably being produced by cyanobacteria, probably many of them in communities like those stromatolites. So we see fossil record of stromatolites and we see geochemical evidence that we argue is evidence of there being oxygen around in the environment in small amounts before the great oxidation event. So again, the geochemistry is telling us something similar to the fossil evidence, which is that it's not as simple as life figures out how to make oxygen and boom, away it goes. We had a long period of time, it looks like, when life was around, probably making oxygen, but the, but the environment was not taking off into a 20% or anything close to that oxygen-rich atmosphere. Right, so here's this, taking this diagram again from my friend Tim Lyons and adding into it oxygenic photosynthesis. We think oxygenic photosynthesis is old. Um, I think today we might extend this back to 3.5 based on some other data that's out, that's out there now. Um, but the rise of oxygen was delayed and didn't happen until around 2.3 billion years ago. So in text summary so far, before we get to the conclusion here, how am I doing on time? I have 10 more minutes, perfect. Um, so summary so far, the great oxidation event occurred around 2.3 billion years ago. We kind of took that as a given. I didn't really show you the evidence for that, but just take that as a given. Um, evidence of microbial mats, which when fossilized are stromatolites, that might have produced oxygen are found as far back as 3.5 billion years ago. Molybdenum and other elements in ancient ocean sediments suggest a slightly oxidizing surface environment, and hence, arguably, and this is all arguable, but arguably oxygen production, at least by 2.5 billion years ago. And I didn't show you this evidence, but, but there's other things that get a little more complicated to show around molybdenum and molybdenum isotopes and chromium isotopes and stuff like that, all of which let you extend this kind of argument back to almost 3.5 billion years ago. That's geochemical evidence. And so, yes, photosynthesis was necessary for the great oxygen oxidation event. We don't think you can get a 20% or even close to an oxygen atmosphere on Earth without having biology pumping oxygen in the environment. But it originated much earlier. Another way of putting this is photosynthesis is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient on its own to explain why we wind up with a heavily oxygenated atmosphere. So this question, what caused the Great Oxidation Event, we can be a little bit more sophisticated about it now. The question we really need to be asking is not what caused the event, but what kept oxygen low before the Great Oxidation Event? It was being produced, we think, but something was keeping it down. So there's broadly two arguments that people make, and one that I'll argue is, is more likely or to be more important um, that, uh, to try to account for this. So, we need to get into one more step of geochemistry to, to, uh, to understand the first of these arguments. So we talk about oxygen in the atmosphere, but it turns out that oxygen in the atmosphere, the accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere is a consequence of burial of organic carbon. Now, how does that work? So it's a very simple way to sort of conceptualize this. So, so it, it, this is such a tight relationship that in the literature you'll find people talking about organic carbon burial as if it's synonymous with oxygen production. And unless you know what's going on, it's like, why are they talking about organic carbon burial? Why are they talking about organic carbon burial? What is this? So I want to get this across to you here. So CO2 and water are the reactants in photosynthesis, in oxygen-producing photosynthesis. So they react to make oxygen and organic carbon. That's the photosynthetic reaction. But as you all know unconsciously, if not consciously, because you're doing this right now with your breakfast, um, the back reaction of aerobic respiration takes oxygen and organic carbon and turns it back into CO2 and water. We're all doing this right now as we speak. And on a global basis, these are pretty finely balanced, actually. Pretty much all the organic carbon and oxygen that are produced every year by biology are reconsumed by respiration. I mean, why wouldn't it be that way? The organic carbon is there, there's oxygen in the atmosphere, so if if, if this is being made, there are bacteria and other organisms that are going to do this back reaction and respire it. So how do you actually then accumulate any oxygen in the environment at all? How do you end up building up oxygen in the atmosphere? What happens is that there's a trickle of organic carbon that gets buried in sediments, 
on geologic time scales and gets protected for, for hundreds of millions or billions of years from reoxidation. And for every mole of organic carbon that you bury, you leave behind a mole of oxygen in the atmosphere. So there's this, so burial and sediments, this is geology now, right? So the, everything here is biology, but this is geology. And so if you do things that change the efficiency with which you can bury organic carbon in sediments over time, you can change the source, the effective source of oxygen in the atmosphere. So one classic argument that has been made is that the rate of burial of organic carbon in sediments might have changed, either because of geological changes or maybe because of changes in evolution that change the efficiency with which organic carbon gets packaged and sent into sediments. Um, and so perhaps early on in Earth history, we were simply burying less organic carbon than we are today. And maybe, that, maybe there was a big change that caused the great oxidation event. So this gets too complicated to go into. Um, I just want to summarize the, the result. People have looked at this hard. They've used carbon isotopes, and this is a whole hour-long lecture to explain how you use carbon isotopes to get at this. But they've tried to reconstruct the fraction of carbon in the surface environment that gets buried as organic carbon through time. Here's 3.5 billion years ago, here's today. And there is indeed a bit of a trend. We are bearing a bit more organic carbon today than we used to. But, and, and this is an attempt, this, this study by Christensen Totten is an attempt to really put rigorous statistics on this. Um, and the statistics uh, tell you that yes, there is a change here, but it's not enough to account for the great oxidation event. So there has been an increase in the burial of organic carbon, which means there is an increase in the effective source of oxygen in the environment, but it's not enough to explain this big change that we see 2.3 billion years ago. So we need to look for other things instead or in addition. And so here again, we come to geology. What about the geological sinks for oxygen? So over geologic time, we produce oxygen through burial of organic carbon, which leaves oxygen behind. And we also have escape of hydrogen to space, which is a source of oxygen, which I talked about at the beginning. But what happens to that oxygen that gets accumulated in the atmosphere? Well, it reacts with things. It reacts with uh, reduced minerals on the continents through, during weathering. It reacts with volcanic gases and with rocks on the seafloor. It reacts with volcanic gases on land and with metamorphic gases. These are all sinks, ways of consuming oxygen. And so the question that has loomed large in the last 10, 15 years is, well, can we get better understand all these sinks? And did, how do they change? And if you think about it, the Earth's interior is a very chemically reducing place. It's effectively an infinite sink for oxygen. And most of the planet is the interior. Right? The oxygen that we're talking about, the atmosphere, is this very thin scum here. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the mass of the planet. And so um, changes, even small changes in the interaction between the interior and the surface can make a big difference in the oxygen sink strength on the surface. So you could have things, the most controversially, what if the actual redox state of the mantle changed slightly? In, in Steve's talk, which he summarized, when he summarized Steve Moyes' work, he talked about possible changes in the, the oxygen fugacity of the mantle. That's a way of talking about how reducing the mantle is. Has this changed over time in some ways? Has the con composition of the continental crust changes, changed in ways that would change the sink strength of oxygen? And what about the composition and flux of volcanic gases from the interior? How is, have those things changed? So all these things have become areas of, of serious investigation over the last decade or so, and it turns out there's support for each of these ideas. Again, it's, argue, it's argued about, but, but there's a blizzard of papers, and this is only some of them, there's more, where people have attacked various ideas like this and shown, hey, yeah, this could be true, this could be true, this could be true, and we're only now getting into the, into the stage where people are starting to uh, attack some of these papers and see which ones can be shot down. So this is an area of very, um, I have a lot of intellectual ferment right now, um, of looking at these geological sinks and trying to understand which ones are important and which ones aren't. And what I'd like to leave you with is the thought that perhaps they're all important, perhaps these are all just different parts of the elephant um, that we're all feeling in our blindness. Um, and imagine this kind of thought experiment. Imagine we begin with a hot earth, an earth where there's, where there's a very rapid exchange between the surface and the interior because it's hot and it's, it's in motion, the mantle is convecting faster and things like that. Um, and so you have a lot of interaction between whatever oxygen is produced here and the reduced interior, and so oxygen can never really rise, can't really take off, because you have too rapid interaction with the surface and the interior. And then as the planet cools down, you kind of slowly freeze that out, right? You slow down the interactions between the surface and the interior, and oxygen can increase. And perhaps all these things we're talking about, change in crustal composition, change in the amount of the crust, change in volcanic gases, all those really are symptoms. Changes in those things are going to be symptoms of cooling of the planet.
So maybe what we really need to do, if we really want to nail this question, this topic, is to sort of develop a theory of the Earth. There have been some previous attempts to write books called Theory of the Earth. Perhaps what we need to do is, as a community, try to put together a theory of the Earth system that really integrates the, what, the story that's emerged from the surface and what we're starting to figure out about the deep interior and its interaction with the surface. And we really need to sit down as communities together and try to figure this out. It turns out that surface Earth scientists and deep Earth scientists don't tend to talk to each other all that much don't tend to do research all that. They don't even understand each other's questions and problems and vocabulary half the time all that much. Um, but maybe it's time we need to pull that together in order to resolve this problem. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you.